Hi there everyone, Lars here with an early Christmas present for many of you with a follow-up to my Cruzy analysis video. Thanks to the release of Deltarune Chapter 2, we have been gifted a lot of excellent storytelling from Toby Fox. Along with the hours of new gameplay and new routes to explore, I think I have found a lot of information that not only confirms my previous analysis and theory about the couple, but also gives us a concrete scaffolding and route for Chris and Susie to become a couple. And that is honestly why I've wanted to make this video, because my last go on this subject dealt more with the theoretical. But now, Chapter 2 graduates the TFS Cruzy from just lovely fan art and shippers swooning to a viable and justifiable outcome by the end of the game. Now, this video is not meant to be used as ammunition against any of the other Deltarune ships. The community at large has done a great job of keeping out shipping war toxicity, and I want that positive trend to continue. So no, I am not loading the cannons and going to town on other ships. And let's face it, Susie is quickly accruing an entire harem, so I think that really all ships at this moment are right now covered. No, instead with this video, I want to accurately lay out the entire romantic progression of Chris and Susie's relationship. Furthermore, I want to highlight what future paths and avenues Toby Fox has already established for later chapters. I also want to discuss what their relationship means for the overall themes within Deltarune and even the world building. Finally, I will explain what we novice writers can take away from this cruisy experience in order to better own our craft and write excellent stories. All right, so let's start with the story of Chris and Susie's growing romance. And now I'm going to say this, I'm going to go into a lot of detail right here. And I will also preface this by saying that everything that I'm about to talk about right here is subjective because love and romance is a very subjective topic. Whatever looks flirtatious or romantic to one person can be the total opposite to another. Many of the things that I will bring up right here, and I'm going to bring up quite a bit of stuff, has already been interpreted differently by other players and shippers. However, that does not diminish the value in understanding all of the events that Toby has already laid out for Chris and Susie's romance. Because by the end of chapter 2, there is a very real love budding between these two characters. So, getting on with it, I am going to split this segment of the video into Chris's perspective and then look at Susie's. The game gives us valuable insights into their feelings and their histories if we play thoroughly through the chapters and focus on the dialogue. So for Chris's part, it becomes evident that they have been observing Susie for a while. I noticed this during the fight against her and Lancer. When the player chooses to do, well, anything to try to win Susie over, and Chris then takes control and compliments Susie's hair, which catches her off guard. They then offer her a basket of worms if she'll just calm down. And now the worms are really funny and all, but as we learn, Susie is willing to eat just about anything because she's always hungry. And Chris has probably seen her then digging for worms somewhere around town, and as a result has thought, that's what I'm going to offer her, because Susie likes worms. And when we look at it, Susie definitely responds positively at first to these worms until she realizes, hey, you don't have a bucket. And this is something that I feel is very important for me to get across right off the bat. Even though we don't fully know what's going on in Chris's head, it's again evident that Chris has been keeping an eye on Susie. Probably because they already have had a one-sided crush on her for a while, or are very curious about her. Very similar to the way that Noelle has acted towards Susie now for a little while. Curiosity and a crush. And that then begins to put a different spin on what we see at the beginning of Deltarune Chapter 1, when Chris is told to go with Susie to the supply closet to go and get chalk. Chris can talk to all of the different people around the classroom, and a lot of the dialogue paints as, oh, Chris, you are in trouble, which, when Chris leaves the classroom, Chris is immediately in trouble, and there's the likeliness that they might get their face chomped off. But we can begin to read these dialogue moments 
a little bit differently that maybe Chris is again acting like Noel and is looking for information to better understand what they're getting themselves into. Well, everyone's giving them very negative information, so when they come on out and Susie comes at them, it's very obvious that Chris is scared. Their relationship starts off very antagonistically. But then again, that's the point. That's the beauty of their relationship. Because at the heart of Deltarune is this theme of becoming friends with everyone. So as a result, Chapter 1 largely focuses on how Chris and Susie build a friendship first and foremost. Their friendship is forged in the heat of battle, found along the roads of far-flung lands, and solidified with honest conversations between the two of them. Yes, we never see Chris speak directly of their own volition, but it is clear that Chris and Susie do have communications as the game goes on. Chris teaches Susie how to act. They try to flirt with her. They also help her to flirt on her own. They try to help her to express herself in a good, positive way. This then all culminates in the battle against King. When King deceives Ralsei, Chris then has to break the player's control and steps in to save Susie from getting hit. And Susie, in return, strikes King, saving Chris from his evil clutches. If you play the pacifist route, Chris enjoys then a celebration with Susie before going back to the world of the Lightners. There, Susie reaches out to Chris in a way that is not only genuine, but filled with tough tons of heart as she asks Chris if they can go back to the dark world the next day. This is Susie finally letting down all of those barriers and there she is expressing herself genuinely and that facial expression is very very important for later on in the game. Now, after this moment, Chris goes around town and speaks with a lot of people, and many of them comment on how Chris isn't acting like themselves, which is very important for later, um, and that will be in a separate video eventually, but just as importantly as all of these observations are, there's a lot of the people who are commenting about how shocked they are that Chris is still alive. And on top of that, they're a little bit confused that Chris is defensive of Susie. Chris doesn't like it when Monster Kid talks down to her, and Chris can even give a very positive report to Noelle about who Susie is as a person. Now, at the end of chapter one, it mostly then looks like Chris has just made a really great friend. And as a result, a lot of the shipping after the release of Chapter 1 came about mostly because of what the heart wants and all of the fantastic fan art that was done of these two characters. But Chapter 2 already puts a lot of this into a different perspective. Namely, that Chris was so excited in the last chapter about becoming friends with Susie because they're harboring a crush on her. And the question then becomes, what evidence does chapter two have to prove this? Well, for one thing, already at the beginning of the chapter and even throughout the game, Chris actively works to keep Susie close and even away from Noelle. The excuses for why Chris and Susie are alone are meant to exclude Noel, and even at the end of the game, they can try to block Noel from being with Susie at the carnival. And Chris is incredibly incredulous that Susie would go with Noel to the fair. Again, we are subtly clued in as to how observant Chris is, that Chris is very clearly aware that Noel has a massive crush on the same girl that they have a crush on. But we really get some interesting things going when the gang is in Queen's Domain. Again, depending on how you play, Chris can give Susie a chance to show off her meager healing magic, which really means a lot to Susie. And Chris can also give Susie a present at the fair. Interesting. Pay attention to that, because if you have given Susie the gift, I am pretty certain that that's going to come up again, especially because Susie gets so excited to receive this gift. She gets flustered, and then she vows to not be outdone, and she would have given Chris a present if it had not been for discovering Noel hiding in the stand. So this is something that, depending on how you play the game, I expect to see this moment come back later on. 
And then when you go and you buy the, the tea and you drink it, Chris is notably into drinking Susie's tea. Ralsey calls this out, that, they're, that they seem to be really into it, and Susie again gets flustered and asks Chris to stop staring at her as they are drinking her tea. Now then, again, these observations can be easily overshadowed by Noel, who has her very obvious crush on Susie, and a lot of people have focused on what can be done with her tea, and then also a lot of people have been focusing in on how Chris reacts to Ralsei's tea. Again, with Ralsei, I'm going to get to everything that's going on with him in a later video. I'm just right now focusing on the good little couple right here. But suffice it to say, the T is a very important moment for those who are looking out for connections with Cruzy. Also, we should make note of when you find the next egg room after confronting the invincible Toby Fox himself, Chris and Susie share moss, which Susie happily accepts and replies, guess even you have your good moments. This little bit of dialogue is a crucial clue for later on, when especially when I get to Susie's perspective on all of this. And very notably, Chris wants to be comforted by Susie more than Ralsey after the fight with Neo Spamton. While I covered why Chris might be standoffish to Ralsey in a previous video, it is very interesting to see how Chris, independent of the player, is showing their interest in Susie, that they want to be comforted by Susie, that Chris is looking for ways to be with Susie independent of what the player wants. It's almost as if Chris is struggling against our control to make their feelings known. And you can easily play the game as the two of them just being best friends, and that's totally fine. But these little details hint repeatedly at Chris having much deeper feelings for Susie. So, now that I've talked at length about how Chris feels about Susie, well, what's her side of the story? Well, to start at the beginning, Susie has been the misunderstood outcast who's turned bully. This is in large part because of how others have been scared of her and mistreated her that she became this kind of character. And true, she is rude and brash, but Susie's core personality is not one that is mean, petty, vindictive, or even violent if we get down to it, and that's because Susie wants friends and this is something that the dark world helps her out with though chris and ralsey want to be friends with her susie's first friend is lancer he is her darkner her time with him and dealing with getting imprisoned and choosing to spare him susie is finally able to face her own insecurities and learn what it means to be a friend but even before Susie befriends Chris and Ralsey, she is taken aback by Chris's attempts to reach out to her and even lightly flirt with her. Again, this comes across during her fight against Ralsey and Chris. She's caught off guard and she has no idea how to react when they flirt with her or when Chris offers worms. She's also very, very bad at flirting herself, which is something that we should take into account for later on. However, what is most important for Susie in Chapter 1 is that she forges a very strong friendship with Chris. Their adventures together are their secret. She initially doesn't want to share these experiences with others, possibly out of fear of losing Chris to other people. And she is terrified that the whole experience might have been a dream, and that that might mean that she and Chris were never friends friends to begin with. And she even asks Chris this, if they will still be friends if the dark world isn't real, but she gets too scared to completely follow through with that question and, one, and voicing her concern. So it's really great to see that their relationship just continues to progress beyond that point because that's something that is so important to Susie. And it's also sweet to see how excited she gets to just be the hero again. After being the bad guy in so many people's eyes for so long, she, she's happy for this change in her life. She wants to make more friends. She wants to save people. She wants to adventure with Chris and Ralsey. She wants to escape whatever her life is really like back in the Lightner world. Chris is her greatest connection to this better life she's found. Their friendship is firmly established. But then does that mean that Cruzy is just a one-sided crush? That Susie's just all in for the friendship aspect? Nope. The answer is definitely no. And to explain where I go from here, I need to explain something important about Susie. She is definitely a Tsundere character. 
but not just the type of character who is super mean to the protagonist and then swoons after them when she thinks that no one is noticing or anything weird like that that's kind of come to be accepted with most tsundere characters. A tsundere character is someone who is openly cranky and abrasive, but they have romantic feelings beneath that veneer. Their character arc, if done well, is learning how to drop their guard and express their feelings in a way that will be reciprocated. So let's bear that in mind as we progress with Susie's side of the story. Now again, we begin to get a better idea of the history between Chris and Susie when they return to the Dark World when we pay attention to the dialogue. So for instance, when Chris has to spell out the password Apple, Susie remarks that Chris has always smelled deliciously of apples and that she's kind of wanted to take a bite out of them. It's silly and it's all in good fun, though Chris does tease Susie for possibly drinking their apple-scented shampoo later on the game, and Susie even gets excited about the thought. We should also note that Susie starts acting of her own during the beginning of chapter one. She's not dependent on Chris, and that is very important not only for the gameplay, but in being able to express herself more as the story progresses. Susie is excited, as I said earlier, to get a present from Chris, and even somewhat flustered, before going into competitive mode to now return the favor. Susie also enjoys drinking Chris's tea, which again, tastes like apples. Seriously, with all the talk about apples throughout the game, maybe the way to this dragon's heart will be through a Fuji apple or something like that. But things get interesting when the gang is captured by Queen. If you go back and revisit Susie's room and poke around in it, we'll get this silly gem where Susie asks Chris if someone breathed fire through the pipe, would the person on the other end feel it? This scene has been interpreted many different ways, and remember how we view romance is subjective. But still, I want to consider three things right here. Actually, nay, I'm going to say four, though the fourth one is more implied than specifically shown. The first thing is this. Susie gives Chris her most sincere and genuine expression as she asks her ridiculous question. We've only seen that expression from her thrice so far in the game. Here, and when she asks Chris to go back to the Dark World, and when Birdly hallucinates Susie confessing her feelings for him. And just as importantly as this genuine expression from Susie is the fact that, again, Ralsei brings attention to Susie's expression, just the same as when Ralsei brought attention to Chris's weird behavior drinking Susie's tea. Then we also have to acknowledge again that Susie's just awful with flirting, like any good Sundere character is. But the last thing that's really more implied that you have to start connecting some dots right here is this. There's only one pipe. That pipe leads to Chris's room. Who's on the other end of that pipe? It's Chris. When I consider all three elements brought together, the ones that we can very specifically see, and also if we if we want to start drawing connections right here through the pipe, this silly scene really looks like a bad attempt on Susie's part to flirt with Chris. And this is only further emphasized by the fact that Susie's time with Noelle, as the two of them are on the Ferris wheel, if you decide to make Susie flirt with Noelle, it's a really bad flirt. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But then again, we also have to notice that when you make Susie flirt with Noelle, the expression... Is, is rather different. Susie always acts really just like, ah, I've got no idea how I'm supposed to act around this person as I'm flirting with them. It's all very tight and constrained and flustered. But like a real Tsundere character who then lets down their defenses for the person that they like, Susie showed that genuine expression to Chris for the first time when she actually tries to flirt with Chris. And so I then pair this particular situation right here where we see her be genuine as she flirts really badly with Chris to when she is sharing moss with Chris and says, I guess even you have your moments. That line is classic Sundere speech. This silly compliment, the awkward flirt, and the apples, it all hints that Susie's developing a crush on Chris. 
Now, after defeating Queen, Susie and Chris go around hometown, and seeing these two hang out away from the Dark World is just so healing to my torn and tattered soul. It also says a lot about how Susie's willing to hang out in the creepy graveyard with Chris. She stands up for Chris when they are indirectly teased by Monster Kid and Snowy, which is absolutely delightful. It's cool to see that she unknowingly reciprocates Chris's feelings about others misunderstanding them or even teasing them, and she waits for Chris even when she doesn't want to be around certain places like QC's diner or the police station. And it shows that, yeah, she honestly cares. She's not just going to ditch them. And, of course, you can uh, see how she's patient when Chris goes to speak with Onion. And it's also just wonderful to watch them both get sick when Chris uh, shares the chocolates from undine with her it's just ah i love it and i love when Susie witnesses the very very awkward public confrontation between asgore and toriel the reason why i like this is because Susie doesn't pester chris about it her response and expression might suggest that she understands what it means to be in a broken family and this then makes her reaction to toriel very interesting and i think that is something to watch out for in the future and of course, we cannot forget visiting Rudy in the hospital. Rudy is a real gem, and I love how he can just read the room and the moment. He acts all tough to Susie, but really, he's just a softie. And I think he's onto something when he tells Chris to take Susie to the movies. Of course, Susie really wants to go. So perhaps Rudy sees something that many of us don't. We'll just have to see. But the moment where the two friends are just sitting out by the lakeside, saying nothing is pure beauty. It's hard to say what's going through Chris's head at the moment, but Susie is clearly enjoying herself. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, and the picture right here is a thousand words that don't need to be said between these two. This is a powerful moment that quietly solidifies their friendship and closeness. Finally, it's great to see Susie and Chris together at the Dreamer house. Toriel and Susie quickly take a liking to each other, and when Chris and Susie are finally alone on the couch, there's the chance to talk about the upcoming carnival. Should the player have Chris choose Susie to go to the fair with, her reaction is very telling. She immediately acts like a typical tsundere in yelling at Chris that they're avoiding the question altogether. But then she says that, of course, Chris would be there too with her getting a little bit flustered and all this, and then of course she changes the subject completely. Classic Tsundere. And that's just it. You see, Susie started out as a cold, dangerous, uncaring character who, as she started opening up, has had a very hard time expressing herself. However, as we learn, Susie really wants friends. She wants that love in her life. And it might even be possible that she's developing some romantic feelings for Chris and that, again, she isn't sure how to express them. So when we consider the Moss scene, the dialogue in her prison room, her inability to flirt, Susie's time around hometown with Chris, and finally that little bit on the couch with them talking about the fair, what I see is a fantastic start to a romance with Chris, as per the expectations of what we know a Tsundere character to be. Okay, I know I've already covered a lot here in this video, and what I hope is that this shows that there is already very solid in-story evidence for Cruzy to happen. We're seeing everything unfold just as I previously said it would, that Toby has built a scaffolding for their relationship to progress. Chapter 2 proves that. We are left then to wonder with the cliffhanger at the end of Chapter 2 as to what Chris and Susie will face next. Given everything that we've seen the duo do around hometown, Chapter 3 will probably dive deep into the story of what really happened to the Dreamers. Because Susie has already shown an understanding towards Chris's situation, we can guess that she will be a pillar of strength for them in the upcoming ordeal. Because Mike, or whoever the smiling entity in the television is, will definitely put Chris through the ringer. 
Not only will there be family drama, we are definitely going to see Susie Zilla crop up in some way or another. And then because the Drawing Dragons book has been referred to twice so far in these chapters, we and we are now in the house, that's also going to be addressed. I guarantee it will be. As a result, we have two fantastic moments for these two to open up about something that is going to be absolutely and hilariously embarrassing for both of them. There's also the fair to be considered, and the player's choice will definitely have a ripple effect for how that is going to play out. Chris and Susie have plenty of opportunities to grow even closer moving forward in the game from chapter to chapter. And if we, as the player, have decided to pursue a relationship with Susie, it's clear from Chris's dialogue and independent actions that they will take the opportunity to kindle a romance with her. And the evidence suggests that Susie is not opposed to that either. But speculating further on what events will happen goes into the realms of blatant fanfiction. Which, as a fun plug-in right here, I have written a Christmas-themed fanfic for Cruzy. The link will be in the description. Now, I want to focus for a moment on what the Cruzy ship means for Deltarune in the terms of the game's themes and even its world-building. See, Deltarune is at its heart about establishing healthy friendships. Here we have two outcasts, a prankster and a tsundere, growing close and becoming best friends. This friendship has inspired Suzy, and... As arguably the lead protagonist, she is confronting now her own fears and prejudices, and she has already begun friendships with Noelle and Birdly. She became friends with Ralsei and Lancer, and has spared many of the Darkners, developing many more wonderful relationships. And Chapter 2 hints that the next big friendships, in the classroom at least, will be between her, Jockington, and Caddy. Whether as friends or as a couple, Chris and Susie's relationship is the catalyst for all this positive change. Furthermore, Deltarune is a game about choices. We are told at the beginning that our choices don't matter, and this is largely because the ending of each chapter is predetermined. We cannot stop Chris from opening up the Dark Fountain. We cannot stop the struggle between them, the player, and whatever other entities are at play in the game. And the night continues to stalk both worlds, ripping open new fountains. Angel's Heaven is coming no matter what we do. And yet, our choices already have ripple effects throughout the game. If we let Chris and Susie's relationship play out for maximum positive effect, we can build a wonderful town and save many darkners. Or we can empty the dark world of its inhabitants if we abuse that relationship to engage in wanton violence. Our choices definitely do matter, but so too do the independent choices of Chris and Susie. One of the most significant moments of independent action is when Chris steps in to save Susie. It proved their friendship towards Susie, and she stepped in then to save them in return. We have no control over any of those actions. And then Susie learns how to act on her own. This is very significant because it empowers the entire team to do far more to defeat enemies and save the day. The game mechanics, the very rules of this world, are then expanded to the hero's benefit. And it's important that Susie acts independent of Chris. Why? Because it proves that she has her own feelings and willpower, which does play into her own thoughts and desires and how they are voiced throughout the game. But I also see it as something that inspires Chris. In Chapter 2, Chris makes a conscious effort to help Spamton and gain their freedom from us, the players. And it's not us, the players, who even desire this. We can empower Chris to go through the motions, but it is Chris alone who takes on that quest. It is Chris who leaves the party. Chris wants to be free, and I believe that this is not only inspired by Spamton's crass deals, but because they witnessed Susie using her own willpower to break the rules of how Chapter 1 worked. If she can do it, they can do it too. Becoming friends with Susie is putting Chris on a path to save themselves. And so then when Susie tells Chris at the end of Chapter 2 that they can move on their own, that simple line hits like a freight train. Choices do matter. And Cruzy perfectly illustrates this. Alright, with all that said, hopefully you Cruzy fans feel far more vindicated and assured of your ship. If you are opposed to the Cruzy ship, well that's perfectly fine. I hope that I've at least given you some food for thought and some things to check out on your own. 
But now is where I am going to get into the weeds about what we novice writers can learn from all of this. The first big lesson is this, sculpt your couples. Don't just ship them. This comes back to one of my earliest videos on this channel. If you want to build your romances over the course of your stories, you've got to do it incrementally. Simply shipping two characters or more, depending on the ship, usually lends itself to hastily slamming the two characters together. And even if the scenes are very well written, it will be hasty and lack a lot of the fun buildup and sweet payoff that comes with carefully and laboriously crafting the romance moment by moment. Toby Fox has laid out all of these moments across chapters 1 and 2 for us to see what relationship is forming between Chris and Susie, and where Susie and Noelle's interactions have been largely characterized by Noelle's massive crush, Chris and Susie's relationship has integrated many more moments that have nothing to do with romance. Things like friendship, sparing enemies, solving puzzles, adventuring, family issues, eating things they probably shouldn't, and the list goes on. All of these moments solidify their friendship and build a powerful understanding between them that creates a solid foundation for their romance. In my previous Cruzy video, I said that I wanted two misunderstood characters to share a healthy romance. Many times, angsty outcast characters are just slapped together because they understand each other, whatever that means. Well, in the real world, especially for teenagers, that rarely, that rarely works out for the best. Believe me, I've watched many of my students go through nasty breakups in the past, and I've heard the sob stories. Here in Deltarune, Chris and Susie are building a strong foundation of understanding one another through their conversations and their shared experiences, the ones that they actually have together. But not only that, they're both growing independent of each other and inspiring and protecting the other as well that is very important because when writing a healthy romance the characters must have autonomy and personality beyond their interactions with the person they love and those moments of independence from their significant other should be engaging and endearing if a character is an absolute jerk to others but then warms up around the person they love yeah that's bad and that is not good for writing a healthy romance. This is how you craft a true understanding between two outcast characters. And Toby Fox is doing it brilliantly. Finally, always be thinking about how the relationship can be tested and strengthened. Some of the best romances I've ever seen are the ones that grow through mutual respect, through talking things out, and by working together to survive whatever comes next. Chris and Susie have a lot of adventures ahead of them, and they'll tackle them together. Even when the ship has sailed, if you stop progressing the couple, well then it just grows stagnant. The, the relationship then ceases to really have meaning. Now, that doesn't mean you should crank it up to 11 and have them suddenly get pregnant or something dumb like that. That's usually a trope or ploy of novice writers because it's very easy then to say that, hey, look, the relationship is even more serious than it was before. Here's a baby. But you don't have to go that far. You can use just a simple conversation where they have a difference of opinions to show that there's still room for them to work things out. Or maybe introduce a problem that requires them to split up and use their autonomy uh, to overcome it or that they have to work even closer together than before in order to surmount that issue. Watch how they react differently when they encounter the same person or the same challenge. These little details, these smaller things, can help keep a relationship alive, vibrant, and fresh. You don't always have to hurl just the biggest thing at them and see how they react to that because, well, that's not really how romance works. All right, I think I've said plenty by now. Cruzy is an adorable ship, and I love it. I still think it is one of the smartest crafted romances put right under our noses in any game I've played, and it continues to grow in my estimation the more I look into it. I hope that writers out there can take away some great lessons from this, and that fans of the ship will be heartened by what I have shared. 
If you'd like more writing advice, please check out our other YouTube videos and also our podcast, Camille's Harem, found on Podbean, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, The Works. We also have writing exercises for you to check out on our Pinterest page, writing discussions at our subreddit and Discord, and more. We invite you to become part of our growing community, and I personally invite you to check out my Cruzy fanfic during this holiday season. And if you enjoy it, then please go check out my other books. They are a blast, and I hope that you will read them and enjoy them. Links for all of that is down in the description. And until the next video, y'all, keep shipping cruisy, happy holidays, and tschüss.